From the National Congress of American Indians, this is The Sentinel. Welcome to the premiere episode of The Sentinel, bringing to you all things NCAI from our inception in 1944 to present day. I am your host, Kenrick Escalani, Director of Digital Media at the National Congress of American Indians and citizen of the Quetzal Nation. And I'm your co-host, Yana Allen. I serve as the Director of Communications at NCAI, and I'm a citizen of the Quapaw Nation and a descendant of the Cherokee Nation and Yuji peoples. Today, we're talking about the origin story of the National Congress of American Indians. And what historical issues prompted the need for a national Native organization? To begin our story, we're going back to the 1940s, an era of termination and the birth of a National Congress. It was a time of rapid change that created a turbulent political and social landscape for Indian country. The primary driver of much of this change came in the form of World War II. The world was still reeling from the aftermath of the First World War, and the United States tried to remain out of the impending war. That is, until December 7, 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. More than 44,000 Native Americans enlisted and served honorably in the military during this period, and directly contributed to the victory of the United States and its allies. Native code talkers, warriors who used their indigenous languages as unbreakable military codes, paired with stunning visuals of Ira Hayes helping raise the U.S. flag at Iwo Jima cemented the importance of Native peoples in the outcome of the war. While the end of the war signaled the reduction of funding for tribal services by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, it also saw the return of Native veterans and an increase in the urban Native population who began to use their platforms to engage the political mainstream. It was during this time that members of Congress and other federal influencers began to aggressively lead the termination and relocation era, a time when federal policy aimed to relocate and assimilate Native peoples, while terminating tribal nations of their federal status, stripping them of the right to self-governance and self-determination. In fact, termination was the single greatest threat to tribal sovereignty in the 20th century. Tribal leaders from across the country knew they had to act. And so, in 1944, nearly 80 delegates representing 50 tribal nations and associations from across 27 states met in Denver, Colorado to establish the National Congress of American Indians. NCAI provided tribal leaders a national platform and a megaphone to show the federal government and the world, the unified voice of Indian country. In that inaugural year, NCAI passed 18 resolutions that focused on three main themes, sovereignty, civil rights, and political recognition. With early successes in securing voting rights for tribal nations in Arizona and New Mexico, NCAI turned its attention to fortifying its ability to navigate the legal and political systems of Washington, D.C. Although a young organization tasked with carrying the collective weight of Indian country on its shoulders, NCAI was full of grit and perseverance. Tribal leaders were determined to have NCAI serve as their watchdog in the nation's capital to take on every challenge threatening sovereignty and seizing every opportunity to create better futures for tribal communities. Now, almost 80 years later, NCAI stands upon its powerful foundation and is laying the groundwork for generations to come. We hope you enjoyed learning about NCAI's origin story. Stay tuned in this and forthcoming episodes of The Sentinel as we dive deeper into NCAI's past, present, and future. We will return to our story in a moment, but first... We would like to take a short break to highlight some of the hardworking staff at NCAI and the important work they do. Please enjoy this episode's Staff Spotlight. For this episode's Staff Spotlight, we'd like to welcome Violet to the podcast. Violet is a former Wilma Mankiller Fellow here at NCAI. After starting as a policy associate, she now works as a digital media and special projects associate with NCAI. Welcome, Violet. 
Hey Young, thanks for having me. My name is Violet and I'm a member of the Hoopa Valley tribe in Northern California and a descendant of the Yurok tribe. Last July, I began at NCAI fresh out of college as a Wilma Man Killer Fellow. Throughout my time as a fellow, I've primarily worked on our policy team here at NCAI. With a background in Native American studies from the University of Oregon, working for four years at our University Women's Center and being a co-director of our Indigenous Women's Wellness Group on campus, I became passionate about addressing the issues of gender-based violence that many of our women, girls, and two-spirit relatives face. With that background, I've had the pleasure of helping to facilitate our Violence Against Women Task Force here at NCAI, in partnership with our co-chairs, Dr. Juana Mahill Dixon and President Shannon Holsey. Beyond the scope of that area of policy, I've had the chance to work on some environmental issues facing my own tribal communities. As people of the Klamath and Trinity Rivers in Northern California, our rivers and salmon are and have always been central to our cultural lifeways. Back in March, my colleague Quinn Buckwald and I put together a panel for the United Nations Water Conference to address the acute crisis facing the Klamath River as a result of damming, and to highlight the amazing decades-long work being done by tribal leaders and members of my community to have these dams removed. Nowadays at the organization, I've primarily shifted my focus to delivering the Sentinel podcast to Indian country. I believe this platform, alongside our blog and social media presence, is a great way to pay tribute to the tireless efforts of our ancestors and elders before us, and another vehicle to support the next generations of emerging tribal leaders involved in defending sovereignty and promoting the well-being of all indigenous people across Indian country. Setia, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us, Violet. If you like what you've heard here today, follow us on our social media at NCAI1944 and subscribe to The Sentinel, now available on all streaming platforms. So now that you've heard a little bit about what's happening during NCAI's founding years in 1944, let's fast forward to a later chapter in NCAI's history, the first mid-year conference. Some of our listeners here today may be attendees of NCAI's three conferences held each year, but it was not always that way. As we prepare for our upcoming mid-year convention in Marketplace, we thought we'd revisit the origins of this event. For this segment, I'd like to welcome NCAI archival specialist Suzanne Gould to help us tell the story of NCAI's second largest yearly event. Thank you, Kenrick. So what did we uncover? Through examining archival records from the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, we learned that the first mid-year conference was held in the summer of 1977, a time of disco and gas rationing. The first Star Wars had just premiered, and polyester jumpsuits were all the rage. President Jimmy Carter had just begun his term of office, and the United States had entered peacetimes following the Vietnam War. But for Indian country, a battle had just begun. At the time, there were a growing number of anti-Indian and anti-sovereignty sentiments and groups across the nation, forming to spread misinformation about American Indian and Alaska Native peoples. And the new Carter administration was not delivering on the promises it had made to Indian country. With the issues facing tribal nations too great to wait until the annual convention that fall, a push by NCAI's executive council established the need for a third conference in the early summer to address the impending threats to sovereignty. NCAI's leaders at the time felt a sense of frustration with the administration, specifically the continued vacancy of a newly created cabinet level position of Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Indian Affairs, formerly known as the Commissioner for Indian Affairs. For reference, this position is currently held by Brian Newland of Bay Mills Indian Community. NCAI and tribal leaders had offered up several suggestions for qualified candidates at the request of the administration. However, delays persisted in the selection process. Written accounts of the event stated that these frustrations hung like a dark cloud over the meeting. Leaders wondered, did the input of Indian country matter to the Carter administration? Was the candidate already chosen? NCAI President Mel Tanasket was one of the leading candidates recommended for the position. Much of Indian country, including NCAI and its allies in Congress, wished to see him in the position. Ultimately, 
Forrest Gerard of the Blackfeet Nation was selected in September 1977 and served in that role until January 1980. So what else did conference attendees discuss at the first mid-year conference? By this time, NCAI had become a powerful representative voice in Indian country and was able to host a Senate oversight hearing in conjunction with the conference. The subject of this hearing was Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, otherwise known as Public Law 638. Just two years after this adoption in 1975, there were already issues with the implementation and the administration of the law. Ernest Stevens Sr. of the Oneida Nation is a former NCAI First Vice President and was the staff director of the Senate Select Committee on Indian Affairs at the time. Today we are speaking with the son of the First Vice President Stevens, Chairman Ernie Stevens Jr., on his father's legacy. Welcome, Chairman. Thank you. Chairman Stevens, the Senate hearing was held in conjunction with the first NCAI mid-year conference, due in large part to your father's influence in Washington. Can you speak to us about his work and legacy in Indian country? Okay, we got a couple days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, first of all, this is, I, I didn't know about the Senate hearing, but you know who who holds a Senate hearing in in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico? You know, only Ernie Stevens. But uh, Ernie Senior was um, he was you know he was a, a, a groundbreaker, uh, somebody who just you know wanted to change the world. In Indian country for the better because he's seen it from the ground up and and uh, you know it's breaking barriers from day one to be the first Native American to run a Native American organization in Sacramento and from there that's where he was recruited uh, um, from the uh, Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs under the Nixon administration and again I don't know the details because um, I was a little boy um, but but he was he was he came in as like a deputy commissioner, something like that, and he worked for the guy that brought him in was named Louis Bruce, and he was what then they now they call it assistant secretary, and those the highest position was the the commissioner, and the commissioner was a was a Mohawk uh, um, Indian named Louis Bruce, and um, and so Louis Bruce brought in these guys, and there 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 was a, one was Lee Cook. And uh, Sandy McNabb, yeah, and and they were there, there was they brought in these guys to overhaul the bureau, and and it's it's amazing we don't remember these things, but but I do remember they called them the Cats and Jammer Kids, and and that was another there was other nicknames for them, but when they came in uh, to 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 D.C. that they they were charged with overhauling the bureau. And, and at that time, the bureau was, you know, desks and robots, not, I'm kidding, desks and people, and, and mostly non-Indians. And, you know, they, they, they shuffled paper. And there was so much that could be done for Indian country. And you could go down the list of all the things that, that, that could be done um, that wasn't being done. And, and uh, these guys changed it for the better. And they went out to Indian country. My father, you know, without a... Without a uh, cell phone or, or, uh, or uh, a uh, computer and not a lot of staff, you know, not only did he cover uh, the, the capital by himself often, but he covered all of Indian country. And, and uh, you know, he, he just, he was uh, amazing and iconic, and, but he just was a naturally smart guy, just a grassroots Indian guy without an education. And, and his education was front line on everything, front line for Indians, front line in Korea, and front line in Washington, D.C. And those guys uh, uh, went in and, and, and changed the world. They changed the, the, the focus and the attention and, and the uh, priority for the Bureau to, to taking care of Native America. And without those guys, we would, the, the, uh, the services to, to Native America would have been uh, us back many years, they they ch totally totally changed it, and so. But if you take a look at it now, now that if if you know history, then um, uh, they're still it's they're still new. You know, they're still creating change. And then every time the ground was being broken, all the glitz and glamour and the hoopla was going on. He was somebody working on the next project. He he wasn't a guy for 
for uh, praise and for camera and, and all that stuff. He was he was um, uh, just wanted to get to the next project. So so anyway, I, don't, uh, I kind of tailed off on it, but the uh, the hearing in, in Albuquerque is 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 amazing. Absolutely. Your your father was such a staunch advocate for tribal sovereignty and self determination during his long career. Uh, can you share with us how your father's work shaped your own life? It kind of did and it didn't. You know, I'm motivated by this guy, and I wanted to be like him, and and uh, I wanted to do what he did. So I knew he was an advocate in Washington, and he always told me how to advocate in Washington and how to help the tribes. You know, and that's. And so when I got on tribal council, um, I wanted to run for uh, NCAI president. And and what happened was is is um, I tried. Then the the uh, the chairman of of the Indian Gaming Association at that time was the late Rick Hill, who was my mentor and and teacher, big brother, and he was my boys and girls club director when I was a little rebel rousing teenager. We were very close friends, but I couldn't really get his support. Uh, to to uh, run for that position, he felt I, I was uh, you know I was I was, I was only in in, uh, um, in the tribal council for uh, less than two years, and I was still learning. and And he didn't really say tell me not to run for president, but he just you know he told me that he struggled with my my um, my level of experience. And and when your when he, when your best friend tells you that, you got to really think about it. And so that's why I has nothing to do with dad. I, I just, I re, re, uh, reevaluated and then I asked the tribal council if they would support me to run for first vice president. And, and so that was the reason, but because of Rick's, Rick's, uh, um, advice, uh, uh, and council, I decided to run for first vice president. And, you know, and so I, I, I went back to the council and they supported me for that. And, and, and uh, I had talked to, to my, my good friend and mentor, Ron Allen, about it, about running for president. And I was really asking him to step aside and let me run. And he wasn't having no part of that. But so, so we kind of, we kind of went about our, our ways. But by the time I made my decision to, to run for first vice president and was based not on, on Ron's advice or anybody else's, it was on Rick's advice. Uh, Ron had already had a running mate, so so I kind of was up against it at that point, and and um, so so when I told my father about it, I asked him if he would come and help, you know, and and uh, he said he would, and then I didn't talk to him again after that, and he never said one thing about being a, a former uh, first vice president, and then. You know, fast forward, we're in the heat of the battle, and, you know, we've got receptions going on and buttons and pins and everything, you know, the old school NCAI uh, election. And I'm looking out the window at uh, at um, uh, Town and Country, I think that's the name of that big, it's kind of a, a, a compound kind of a hotel a place that we used to do before we went downtown in, in, in San Diego. So it's, uh, I think it was called Town and Country or something like that. And... Uh, so I'm looking out the window there, and I'm saying, what did I do? You know, I'm here my first shot at this. I'm probably 35 years old and, you know, wanted to follow in his footsteps. And then I'm like, like maybe I didn't, you know, because I felt like I was losing the motivation. You know, I didn't have the votes I needed. And uh, it wasn't because I wasn't trying, though, you know. And, and then I'm looking out that window at the, uh, at the hotel there, and, um, and uh, I hear from, my, from uh, over my shoulder, I hear someone say, hey, boy. And that's how that's how my dad addresses me, calls me boy. And um, I looked over my shoulder, and there was the old man. And, and we never talked after he said he was coming. And all of a sudden, he's there, you know. And he really did uh, flip that race for me. And because in, in 1995, he was not retired, but he was kind of winding down his career, especially from traveling. When he, when he retired from Washington, he wanted to just work in Oneida. Everybody still knew him. And it really changed changed the process, and I was elected to to, to the first vice presidency, and um, under and Ron was elected. Uh, uh, so um, we weren't on the same ticket, but we spent our careers working hard in Washington, and he Ron became a mentor to me. Um, so and I've learned all my stuff. I've learned how to do it. I've learned how not to do it, and I've been told how not how not to do it many times by Ron Allen, but mostly he showed me the way. And like my father, mostly Ron just showed me work ethic and 
and that's what that that that's what that brought me to in '95. But you know, w w without all the cell phones and computers and all those things, you know, he he um, he changed the world. And and every place I've traveled in every part of this country, uh, early on, not so much anymore, but early on, it was like I was a hero from day one. You know, and um, you know. Uh, uh, my my older brother he he didn't get the name. Uh, my mother gave me the name as the second son. I don't know why. They say I look like him, but the the old girl in, in D.C. Uh, uh, always would tell me I'm almost as good looking as my dad. I'm not sure what that meant. Um, but but my dad was charismatic and and he was nice and people loved him, you know. And uh, so I, I I carried his name and and uh, everybody everybody knew him. In my early years, he was he was someone who who went to bat for tribes to get to achieve their recognition status. He was a pioneer for that. Um, and like I said, he just he was a little bit radical, but but not in a in a violent or angry way. He was more radical in terms of hey, we can do this, guys. Just let's let's put our minds together and let's do this. You know, it wasn't it wasn't uh, you know some might say it was was uh, a radical in terms of. Maybe um, inappropriate, but I think people in those days, you know, were controlled by the government, and and my dad didn't want to be controlled by the government. We want he wanted tribal governments to control their fate, and that was his thing. That was his passion. That tribal governments control their future and their fate, and for the next seven generations, not the United States government. The, the government, our relationship with the government is based on treaty, and and compacts and and respect. And the law, and the, the supreme law of the land, and that's the way my father saw it. So, so I think it's important to to know that that my dad had those abilities to work on all sides of the aisle. He can he can walk into the House, to the Senate. He had uh, constant communication with the Nixon White House, and he could talk to all the the uh, activists and and uh, and um, you know he he literally was the point of making peace between what would could have been a really ugly point in history. And and he, and he was literally a, a workaholic, and maybe to the point of his own demise, because he just worked and worked and worked. And that's why if you see me, you'll see me. I'll show up. Even in my own events with the Indian Gaming Association, you'll see me show up and get the awards done, and then I'm headed for the door. And and, and uh, um, that's, that's I'm not a nightlife kind of guy. And... Um, you know, I, I've got to be the first, I try to be the first one there. And if you're ever looking for me, i will be at the membership meeting where the rest of the tribal leaders are. I learned that from my father. I agreed with my father that if he helped me, that's what I would do. And that's one conversation 30, almost uh, probably 28 years ago. Um, but that's a conversation that stays with me every step of the way. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman Stevens. Thank you for your time and con contributions. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today. It's, I wish we, you know, my dad is, is 91 years old, and he doesn't say much when I go to visit him. But, but um, you know, um, one of the things that, that, that we did when he was still, he could still move a little bit, we brought him up to, uh, to um, NCI had a, had a, uh, um, had a mid-year here, and, um, and it was the second one, the first one. Uh, he he was he was at the mid year we had in Green Bay, and then this this one was this one was I don't know what year it was, but Tex Hall was the president of NCI, and he, he we brought Dad there, and and I still got it in in the other room here. Um, a um, I can't remember what it was. It seemed like it was an arrow and an eagle feather, and he and he uh, let Dad talk, but he did okay, and 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 it was uh, his. I think it was around. 2004 or five, I'm taking a wild guess, but it was his last public exp uh, uh, public appearance, and he he said he was good. He said that a nice uh, a nice uh, um, statement, and then uh, Tex gave him the uh, 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 this I think it was an eagle feather and an arrow, but but it was it was NCAI it was NCAI mid year at the, at the uh, Radisson. And, and in uh, Oneida, Wisconsin, it was my dad's last public appearance. Wow! Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, we could probably we could probably stay on this call all day. I just again want to thank you for your time and thank you for all your contributions.
Yeah, thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. We're, we're pro, pro giant NCAI lifetime members in good standing, and uh, we appreciate everything you do. Thank you so much. You have a great day, Chairman. Good day. As we delve deeper into the archival documents from 1977, we can sense a more urgent reason to combat the alarming increase in anti-Indian backlash rising throughout the country. Meeting attendees discuss the alarming rise in organizations designed to erode tribal sovereignty and spread misinformation and race-based propaganda about American Indians. They stress the need to show a unified force in combating these threats to Indian country. At the forefront of this anti-Indian crusade was the Interstate Congress of Equal Rights and Responsibilities. While the group started small and local, it spread into a well-funded national organization, protesting recent advances from the legislative and judicial branches that expanded sovereignty and improved life for American Indians in the areas of economic development, health care, and religious freedom. This anti-Indian movement was heavily supported and funded by wealthy landowners, ranchers, and fishermen. With this economic clout, they were successful in pressuring the federal government into reconsidering specific treaties they had vowed to uphold as part of their treaty trust responsibility. Through a strong misinformation campaign, these groups earned the support of legislators who sponsored 14 backlash bills in the 95th Congress. The ultimate goal was to erode tribal sovereignty, abrogate treaties, and terminate the federal government's responsibility to American Indians. More than 30 years after NCAI was founded, it was once again facing many of the same challenges of 1944, defending sovereignty. NCAI is needed now more than ever. Nearly 80 years ago, when NCAI was founded, the organization brought together tribal leaders and citizens to join as one voice to protect tribal sovereignty. Today, we honor that legacy by unifying the interests of American Indian and Alaska Native nations and citizens as a national congress. Join us and raise your voice for all of Indian country. For more information on how to join NCAI, visit ncaiorg forward slash membership. We would like to express our gratitude to our lead researcher and archivist at NCAI, Suzanne Gould, for her contributions to the Sentinel, and a special thanks to the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian for serving as stewards of the NCAI archival collection. In anticipation of our 2023 Mid-Year Convention and Marketplace, Violet Johnson interviewed the Secretary Treasurer of the Shakopee Mewakanton Sioux Community, Rebecca Crook Stratton. Hello, Secretary Crook Stratton. Thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. Please tell us a bit about yourself, including your position within NCAI and your tribal nation. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, I serve as the Secretary Treasurer for the Shakopee Mewakanton Sioux Community. Um, I've been in this position for about five years. Uh, and then for the National Congress of American Indians, I am the uh, Midwest representative, so um, vice president for the Midwest region. All right. Thank you so much for those insights. On this premiere episode of The Sentinel, we are discussing the history of the National Congress of American Indians, including the very first mid-year conference, which took place 46 years ago in 1977 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. 2023 marks the 47th Mid-Year Convention and Marketplace, which will be convening in the Midwest region, your home region, on the beautiful lands of your tribal nation. It's been eight years since the Midwest region hosted a Mid-Year Convention, which was held in 2015 in St. Paul, Minnesota. Could you speak to us a bit about NCAI's Midwest region and your tribal nation as you graciously host us this year? Absolutely. Uh, SMSC is really excited to host uh, the 46th annual mid-year convention uh, here in the Midwest. So the Shakopee Midwest Sioux community is located uh, just southwest of the Twin Cities. So it's really easily accessible. Um, the Midwest region actually uh, makes up 
uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Iowa, and there's 35 tribes uh, here in the Midwest. Uh, so the Twin Cities is actually a great place to um, host a conference because it's easily accessible uh, by everyone with uh, the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport kind of being a hub. But yeah, here in Shakopee, um, we've got about 3,000 acres. Uh, we do a lot of um, environmental restoration on the lands that we have. So uh, we've got beautiful prairie lands, uh, old growth maple forests, some wonderful uh, oak forests, uh, in addition to our many wetlands. Uh, so we are super excited to, to have everybody out and kind of showcase some of the things SMSC is doing in those areas. All right. Thank you so much for that. Many tribal governments of your region are placing an emphasis on education, environment, economic growth, and health. Could you speak to Shakopee's efforts toward these goals? Yeah, you know, here at Shakopee, we are a gaming tribe. We have two casinos, Mystic Lake Casino and Little Six Casino, which really are our main economic drivers. Um, but in addition to gaming, we've got several non-gaming enterprises, uh, like a natural food store. We have a... Um, sports, uh, Dakota Sport and Fitness, so a fitness facility, some convenience stores, um, among other things. Uh, so really, you know, in a, in a great position economically here at Shakopee. Uh, we also, with, um, you know, our, our not sizable land base, but, you know, we've got uh, some lands here that we definitely um manage ourselves. So we've got a land and natural resource department that um, really helps with that planning. Uh, we do a lot of prairie restoration here, um, have some really beautiful prairies. And as part of those restoration uh, and maintenance, we do um, controlled burns, uh, which is kind of a, a fun thing to see. But um, our land and natural resource department actually partners uh, with different agencies to do some of those burns and we also work with our local jurisdictions to burn um, prairies that aren't on the reservation, uh, which is kind of a, a great partnership uh, with those around us. Um, we also, you know, here in Shakopee have many wetlands and uh, we haven't had wild rice for a really long time here, but because of our stewardship and good management of, you know, our lands, we are starting to see um, those precious resources like wild rice return to this area. So I think that's something we are very excited about. And then as far as, you know, education goes, I think, you know, many tribal leaders can relate that uh, a lot of times before we can really get to the heart of things, we have to kind of do a uh, uh, Indian 101, I always call it, um, to kind of get people up to speed, you know, who we are, why, you know, why we do what we do and all that stuff. So I'm really excited about one of Shakopee's initiatives called Understand Native Minnesota. And that's really an effort to educate and improve the narrative um, around Indian people in Minnesota's K through 12 um, public school system. So that's a really great initiative too. Yeah, that's amazing. Thanks so much for sharing that. The Mid-Year Convention and Marketplace held at the Mystic Lake Center, owned and operated by your tribal nation, is now in full swing. What would you like to tell our listeners who are in attendance this week? You know, I like I said, we're very excited to host everybody. Um, we've got some really great, you know, things happening this week. Uh I would say definitely try to get out to Hochokadati and check out our exhibit, Midwakatin Dwellers of the Spirit Lake. Um, head on over to Mazopia for sure and check out our natural food store. We've got an amazing hot bar that has different daily things for lunch and dinner. I think, you know, definitely check out Cultural Night. That will be at Hochokata Tea, and we've got lots of wonderful things planned for that. So, yeah, there's definitely lots to do here, you know, whether you grab a round of golf or go grab some lunch at Mazopia and sit on the patio over there and enjoy some fresh air. We're just, we're happy to have everybody here and hope everybody enjoys. Thank you so much for your time, Secretary Treasurer Crook Stratton. We appreciate your nation's hospitality and look forward to seeing you throughout the convention.
Thanks so much for having me today. I'm also looking forward to catching up and seeing everybody throughout the week. Thank you. We would like to thank the digital media team that made the Sentinel possible. Project lead, Suzanne Gould. Research and script development by Violet Johnson. Audio engineering by Alfred Hernandez. And special thanks to the NCAI communications team, Yana Allen and Kobe Clark, for their collaboration and project support. Become a part of our mission to protect tribal sovereignty. Join us at NCAI's 80th Annual Convention and Marketplace in New Orleans, November 11th through 17th, 2023. Register online at ncaiorg forward slash events. Want to take a deeper dive into the information you've heard today? Visit the Sentinel blog at ncaiorg forward slash sentinel. On behalf of the National Congress of American Indians, I'm Kenrick Escalani. And I'm Yana Allen. Thank you for listening to the premiere episode of The Sentinel. Now, we invite you to listen to a special segment in honor of the memory of a beloved leader and esteemed member of the NCAI family, O.K. Owinge Head Councilman Joe Garcia. Head Councilman Garcia devoted his life to service of his community, tirelessly working to uplift and empower all tribal nations. He began his work at NCAI in 1995, serving in many roles, including as a two-term NCAI president, and most recently as a Southwest Regional Vice President. A remarkable leader, mentor, and friend, Head Councilman Garcia taught us all to stand together, advocate tirelessly, and honor our rich cultural heritage. This segment was originally recorded in November of 2019 in Washington, D.C. at NCAI's Embassy of Tribal Nations. Please enjoy this special tribute to Head Councilman Garcia. I'll do this song. Uh, it's the one that I sang it. Uh, I actually have sung it in a few places besides NCAI, but I think it, it hits the crowd. And so I'll, I'll try to remember all the words, but you know, as age comes on you, hard to remember words to 10,000 songs. <laughs> Put us on this reservation Took away our way of life Tomahawk and a bow and knife Took away our native tongue Taught their English to our young Indian nation Indian tribe So proud to live so proud to die They built houses by the score Won't need teepees, wickums, wickiups, wigwams, adobe homes oh, anymore And all those beats we made by hand Our machine made in Japan China now Indian nation Indian child So proud to live so proud to die Although I wear a shirt and tie I'm still full red man, 
deep inside And someday when the world is gone The Indian nations will return Will return Will return That's what I sang, and the crowd just came to life. I feel it right now. <laughs>